Ready, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, perfect, thanks everybody online. Thank you so much for joining us for our first ever virtual Marine Science Day. We're so excited to have you here. Um, my name is Cinnamon Moffat. I'm the Research Program Manager at Oregon State University's Hatfield Marine Science Center, located in Newport, Oregon. Um, I'm your host for today's main stage talk, so welcome. Just a quick little logistics. This is a webinar format, so you've probably figured out that you do not have control of your mics, cameras, or screen share, but we do hope that you put questions in the chat box, which you can find by clicking on the little chat pop-out box, um, either at the top or the bottom of your screen, and putting in um, chats and questions in that chat box, and we'll get to them at the end. I also just want to let folks know this is being recorded, um, so you'll be able to see this again if you need to or any of the other talks on the main stage in a couple of days on the Marine Science Day web page. Um, I also just wanted to remind folks that this is a series of talks today, so our next talk will start at 1250 and will be Lisa Hildebrandt, who will be talking to us about do gray whales count calories? So come back at that point um, and we will talk a little bit more with Lisa. Um, and if you need any more information, like I said, go back to the uh, Marine Science Day um, main stage page for more information. But I really just want to get us started with today's uh, speaker who is with us now, and that's Bob Ziak, who's going to be talking to us about looking for a tsunami in a forest. <laughs> um, but first, a little bit of background on Bob. Bob, it, Bob Ziak is a research oceanographer for NOAA's Pacific Marine Environmental Laboratory, and he is manager of Ocean Acoustics Program that focuses on a wide variety of research topics, including marine, tsunamic, and volcanic hazards, and developing deep ocean sound technology. And so with that really quick brief introduction, I'm going to hand it off to Bob and Bob, I'll let you take it away. Thank you. Well, thank you, Cinnamon. And hello, everyone. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here and to present our research looking for evidence of tsunami impacts on old and old growth forests in Western Oregon. On, um, as many of you may know, on January 26th in the year 1700, a massive earthquake and tsunami struck the Pacific Northwest, causing severe damage to coastal forests in Washington State. However, the evidence of the impact on coastal trees in Oregon has been more challenging to find. In my talk today, I will present some of the first evidence of tree growth changes caused by the 1700 tsunami, as seen from an old growth stand at Mike Miller State Park in South Beach. Uh, but before I begin my presentation, though, I'd, I want to acknowledge my, um, my very talented colleagues whose hard, way, hard work made this study possible. Uh, first is Brian Black who's a world-class tree ringing expert based at the University of Arizona and was formerly here at the Marine Science Center. Uh, next is Yang Wei, a very gifted scientist and computer modeler who works for NOAA in Seattle and whose tsunami model I'll show later in the talk. And next is my friend Susan Murley, who's a very talented mapping expert based here at OSU and NOAA and had, had made, has made many of the maps we use in our analysis today. But first I'll give a brief outline of my talk. Um, I'll begin with an overview of the plate tectonic setting of the Pacific Northwest. Then I'll describe how scientists discovered evidence for the 1700 earthquake and tsunami and what the impacts of these events were on the Oregon and Washington coast. Next, I'll discuss how changes in tree ring growth patterns can be used to infer past impacts from dramatic environment, environmental events, such as droughts, forest fires, earthquakes, and tsunamis. And after that, I'll show the latest tsunami model for South Beach, Oregon, and discuss what water levels may have been like during the 1700 event. And lastly, I'll show the growth patterns of trees we collected at Mike Miller State Park, which is one of the, is one of the few old growth stands remaining along the central Oregon coast. So let's start off with a little background on the geologic setting of the Northwest. Why is it that Oregon is susceptible to earthquakes? Well, it's because we, we here on the coast are located on a boundary between two massive geologic plates. As I'm sure many of you know, the surface of the earth is broken into numerous tectonic plates, and each of these giant slabs of rock are thousands of square miles in area and float on top of the earth's upper mantle. The boundaries between the plates form the large geologic faults we see on the earth's surface. And when these faults slide against one another, this rapid motion makes earthquakes. In the Pacific Northwest, there's a small plate that's trapped between the two much larger Pacific and North American plates. This small plate is called the Juan de Fuca, and it's shown in the red circle on the upper left. And the Juan de Fuca plate comprises all of the ocean floor off the Oregon coast. Now this slide shows a three-dimensional view of the Juan de Fuca plate. 
The Juan de Fuca is moving eastward toward the coast of Oregon and Washington, where it's pushed beneath North America. Where the Juan de Fuca and North America plates meet forms a large fault called the Cascadia Subduction Zone. I have it labeled here. The Cascadia Subduction Zone extends from Vancouver Island in the north to Cape Mendocino, California in the south. And it's called a subduction zone because one slab of rock gets pushed underneath or subducts beneath the plate next to it. We have a little reference for QR here. Now this map shows the location of all the Pacific Northwest earthquakes that have occurred since the start of the 20th century, shown as the red circles in this diagram. And as you can see, there are certain areas where earthquakes occur more often than others. For example, in the south, where the San Andreas Fault in California meets the Juan de Fuca Plate, there are lots of earthquakes, as you can see. The same goes for the northern boundary of the Juan de Fuca, where the Queen Charlotte Fault comes down from Alaska. And also, the Olympic Peninsula and Puget Sound has lots of earthquakes. And this is because it's a place where there's a big bend in the Juan de Fuca and North American plates. But what is really interesting is that the Cascadia subduction zone shows almost no earthquakes, as you see by the red arrow here. This is really odd, considering it's a gigantic fault, and that similar subduction faults around the world usually produce earthquakes all the time. Scientists think the reason there are a few earthquakes on the Cascadia subduction zone is because it is locked. So rather than both sides of the fault sliding smoothly against each other, both sides of the fault are stuck in building up stress. And the stress accumulates over the centuries and eventually be released as the big one, you know, a magnitude nine earthquake that also generates a dangerous tsunami. But how do we know the Cascadia subduction zone creates great magnitude nine earthquakes if they only happen over time scales of centuries? The big breakthrough in our understanding of large earthquakes in Western Oregon happened in the early 1990s when a United States geologic, ge geological survey scientist named Brian Atwater made a major discovery while studying sediment deposits along the coast. Atwater discovered a gray marine clay layer in low coast, in low coast areas that was caused by a massive rapid influx of seawater. In other words, a tsunami. And tsunamis are typically caused by very large earthquakes. By dating this marine mud layer, uh, Atwater showed it was deposited around 300 years ago in the year 1700. And in addition to the tsunami, Atwater concluded that the coastline had also dropped vertically in elevation by nearly three feet. So now we know the years the earthquake likely occurred, sometime in 1700, but what month and day did the earthquake actually occur? The exact day and time of the Cascadia earthquake was estimated by seismologist Kenji Sataki, based on his findings that a tsunami had struck Japan in, in January of the year 1700. However, the tsunami did not have an earthquake that was felt by the local people, indicating the earthquake was from very far away. A tsunami that occurs without having an earthquake associated with it is called an orphan tsunami. And by examining records of the day and time this orphan tsunami hit the Japan coast, it was determined the earthquake likely came from the west coast of the United States. Now, the image on the right shows an animation of the Cascadia tsunami. So wait for it to begin. Uh, the timing of the tsunami in Japan suggests, again, the large earthquake occurred on the Cascadia subduction zone at 9 p.m. on 26th of Jan January of 1700. And based on the tsunami wave heights observed in Japan, it's thought that the Cascadia earthquake had a magnitude of 9.0 and created a tsunami that struck the Pacific North Northwest coast. And the animation here shows the heights of the tsunami as it traveled across the Pacific Ocean and as it impacts distant coastlines. So now I'll talk about the information that can be found in studying tree ring growth patterns. As I'm sure everyone knows, tree rings show the age of a tree where, the, where there are more rings, the older the tree. The tree rings also keep a record of what the tree experienced during that year and growth season. Oops, sorry, a little bit of a snafu. Let's go back, there we go. And as I pick up where I left off, if the weather was good, and the growth, rings are th the growth rings are thick. And if it was dry or exceptionally cold, or there was a forest fire, the growth rings are small or non-existent. And 
And even just the shaking from big earthquakes can cause the tree growth to change by knocking down trees, causing landslides, and changing how groundwater flows to the trees. These charts th show the thickness of tree rings from a forest in Alaska in the years before and after the great 1964 magnitude nine earthquake there. The chart shows that the earthquake caused dramatic declines in growth in nearby trees as highlighted by the red arrow. So during, during one of our uh, Marine Science Center coffee breaks here several years ago, I was talking with Brian Black, our local tree expert, and I mentioned that although there is evidence that trees along the Washington coast were affected by the 1700 earthquake and tsunami, damaged trees have never been found in Oregon. So then we set out to find trees that were both greater than 300 years old and close enough to the beach to be impacted by a tsunami. And as it turned out, finding trees that meet this criteria are much harder than I much harder to find than I thought. There just aren't that many old growth tree stands left on the Oregon coast. Brian said the two best spots to hunt for old growth trees are the Cape Perpetua Scenic Area near Yahats and the Mike Mill State Park in South Beach. The map on the left shows the location of our study area along the central Oregon coast. And the map on the right shows the location of Mike Miller and Cape Perpetua relative to Newport and Walport. So we first started out our hunt at Cape Perpetua. And Cape Perpetua is of course a wonderful place to do some field work for a few days. And we worked hard sampling several old growth fir trees there. Unfortunately though, at Cape Perpetua, we found that the old growth trees are at high elevation far from the shoreline and are out of the reach of a tsunami. But these old growth trees at high elevation are, are on steep hillsides. So we sampled these trees uh, thinking that they may be good candidates because the trees were growing on stable land and the shaking from the 1700 earthquake would cause landslides that could damage the trees. And that would be, and that would be, that would be seen in the tree rings. But unfortunately, we found no evidence of growth changes in Cape Perpetua, which was very disappointing. Uh, but undaunted, we next moved on to Mike Miller State Park in South Beach, hoping our fortunes would change. And this time we did have some success. We found some 38 Douglas fir trees that are more than 300 years old. The map in the center shows the location of Mike Miller, highlighted by the red circle. One problem though, is that the park is fairly far from the shoreline, roughly a third of a mile, and on elevated terrain on the western edge of Idaho Point. So we weren't 100% sure we'd see tsunami impacts in the tree rings here. Before I show the results of our tree ring analysis, I'll show a summary of the tsunami model my colleague Young Wei made for South Beach based on the 700, 1700 earthquake. Our goal with the model was to estimate how deep the tsunami water was at the trees at Mike Miller. The map on the left shows the water depths at South Beach Peninsula from the 1700 tsunami, where the colors, rep the colors represent the range in water depths over the peninsula. The map on the right shows the tsunami model again, but it's a zoomed in view of Mike Miller and the location of the trees we sampled, shown by the numbers. Because of the topography of the park, the trees were subjected to a wide range of water levels where most of the trees are in water depths of less than five feet, as shown by the blue color, while a few trees are in water depths of up to 20 feet, as shown by the light green colors. I know this tsunami model of water depths in South Beach uh, is alarming, but it's important to note that Washington and Oregon emergency management groups are working hard to prepare for such an event with public education, warning signs, evacu evacuation drills, and other measures. A really good example of these preparation efforts is the new Marine Studies building on the Hatfield campus, which has been designed to be a vertical evacuation structure. So you're probably wondering what the tsunami affected tree ring patterns might look like. The upper left picture shows the tree rings from a coastal tree at 1700. And the bottom diagram shows an example of a tree ring core from 10 years before and after 1700. What is important to see in these images are the decreasing growth widths in the years around 1700, shown by the blue arrow. I'll admit it's a pretty subtle change, but careful measurements can detect very small changes of even a few millimeters. That lets us know there were definitely changes to a tree growth during that year. These diagrams now show the records of the tree ring growth at Mike Miller State Park. Uh, sorry for all the squiggly lines, uh, but I wanted to show you this because there are some key points in this data. The diagram on the left 
shows the tree growth records from around 1700, where the vertical axis shows ring growth amounts in centimeters, and the colors of the lines represent different trees. Now the diagram on the right shows the growth record in more detail, covering the four years before and after 1700, as shown by the red arrow, or highlighted by the red arrow. What you should note here is that there is a significant, significant decline in tree growth during the year 1700, which is consistent with the timing of the earthquake and tsunami. You can also see that the tree growth began declining a few years before the earthquake, which is a little odd. But it's important to remember that tree growth can vary over several years since it can be affected by many factors, including droughts, fires, and even insects. So the decrease in growth in years around the earthquake can be enhanced because the tree growth also had to be decreasing at that time due to some other factors like climate effects. Also, I'll note the red arrows on the diagram on the left show other significant declines in forest growth, which are probably due to these type of climate events, such as droughts. Bob, this is Cinnamon. Just letting you know you have five minutes. Okay, thanks. So our idea that a tsunami in 1700 caused the trees to not grow that year does have one problem. We assume that it is we assume it is the exposure of the trees to the salty tsunami water that caused the trees not to grow. But as we all know, Oregon has a very high amount of annual rainfall. And with the sandy soil at Mike Miller, the trees may not have been exposed to the tsunami water for, very, for a very long time, or for, for, it might have been exposed for a very brief amount of time, especially since the tsunami occurred during the rainy winter season. However, there, there is a large pond within Mike Miller Park, and many of the trees we sampled are near the pond. So we think this pond may have acted as a reservoir for the tsunami water, keeping the salt water near the roots of the trees for a long time. And one way to test this idea is to core the pond sediments to see if we can find a clear tsunami deposit there. And this is definitely in our plans for future work. So thus in summary, our study is the first to use tree ring growth patterns to estimate tsunami inundation effects on the Oregon coast. Tree and cores collected from Mike Miller show several trees have reduced growth before, during, and after 1700, consistent with the timing of the tsunami. The tsunami tree growth declines were not the largest over the lifespan of the trees at Mike Miller, and that there were other large growth declines likely caused by climate events. Our next steps will be to core sediments in Mike Miller Pond to see if tsunami deposits are present there. Also, we plan to test tree rings for water-soluble ions, like carbon-13, to establish the trees were actually exposed to seawater. And lastly, we'll try to find some old growth, more old growth tree stands along the Oregon coast. Thank you, and uh, please let me know if you have any questions. Great, thanks, Bob. I know that was quick. We are getting some questions in the chat, so I'm gonna start at the beginning. Can you talk about, um, did you have to kill the tree to get the growth record? Uh, absolutely not. No, you can take cores from trees and it, it, it doesn't damage the tree. That's a, that was a very uh, significant concern of ours going in. We don't want to damage those trees at all. So this is so rare. Great. And then this is a specific question about one of your slides. Why did 24A growth increase in the year that you showed? <laughs> uh, good eyes. Uh, let's see, 24A, um, the green. Well, like I said, so the trees are over a wide range of topographies. And so, you know, we're just trying to find the ages. So it can be that the tree may have just been in a spot where, uh, you know, due to the shaking of the tsunami, a, a tree nearby was killed and it got more sunlight. And so that tree actually happened to grow better that year. So that's why it's a little bit of a puzzle to put together. Nice. And so this next question might be about historic and it might be about uh, future potential tsunami heights, but what is the range of tsunami heights along the Oregon's northern coast? Oh gosh, we'd have to look at that uh, model in detail, but probably similar to what I showed here for the peninsula. So I mean, maximum heights can be pretty big, you know, 30 or 40 feet. Yeah, and it's very site uh, specific on how high those water um, will go in the future. And just from my side, if you are interested, um, Dagami has some really great mapping products. So if you're interested in learning more about that, you can contact me or probably reach out to Bob directly if you have questions. Yeah, yeah, thank you, exactly, thank you. Yeah, um, one more question. Uh, did trees in other areas in Japan show a decrease in growth prior to the tsunami? 
A great question. I, I, I don't believe a lot of the, Jap the Japanese records were based on tree rings. Uh, it was more written records and uh, observations of a, a tsunami wave in the middle of the night. But, um, so unfortunately, I, yeah, I don't have an answer to the, what the tree rings were impacted more like in Japan. Maybe another study. <laughs> yeah, sure. I want to go. <laughs> that sounds good. Yeah. All right, Bob, we are out of time. That was rapid. Um, thank you so much for joining us. I appreciate it. For those folks that are online, if you have questions, you can reach out to Bob directly. You can contact me. Um, I can get you in contact with him. Um, and just a reminder that we will start our next presentation with Lisa about gray whales um, at 12.50. So until then, go and enjoy Virtual Marine Science Day. Take a look at all of the different exhibits. Um, and again, Bob, thank you so much. You're getting um, virtual claps and thank yous in the chat now. Thank you.